even if it is bad disease, uh, the earlier that we catch it, the more likely there will be a, a curative modality or treatment that can be applied. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, hello. I'm Molly Jacobson. I'm the editor-in-chief over at dogcancer.com. We're over 40 veterinarians, veterinary oncologists, veterinary techs, cancer researchers, and science writers like me pull together to bring you better information about dog cancer today so you have no regrets tomorrow. Today, we're talking to Dr. David Vale, a veterinary oncologist at the University of Wisconsin, where he researches cancer, teaches baby veterinarians, and treats dogs with cancer. Dr. Vale has big insights into how to detect cancer early, early, early to help you get better outcomes when you treat it later. Some of the signs of cancer are subtle. Some of them masquerade as other problems. So this is an important episode for all of us dog lovers. You'll see from my short hair in the interview portion of this show that I had this conversation with Dr. Vale a little while ago, but I'm thrilled to be able to bring it to you today. My team will yell at me if I forget to tell you to like all the things and do all the right things on social to boost our algorithm and help future dog lovers who are also worried about their dogs and whether they have cancer or not find this video because there's a lot of really important information in it. We really want to help you help your dog. So let's get right to that conversation I had earlier with one of America's preeminent veterinary oncologists, Dr. David Vail. So Dr. David Vail, thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about early warning signs of cancer. Oh, thanks and for having me, having me here. It's my pleasure. It's such a pleasure to have you join us. Um, so I've heard that the five most dangerous words in the English language are maybe it will go away or let's see if it grows. And I believe you said that. Yeah, probably somebody said it long before me. One of my mentors um, probably said it first. So it's out there in the vernacular, but it is very true. Uh, you know, most of, and you know, the classic, we were talking about the signs of cancer, the classic sign, of course, that ever, that comes to mind when we think of that is I found a lump or a bump. And in those scenarios, the good news is that the vast majority of lumps or bumps that a, uh, that a caregiver will find are benign disease and can be dealt with, um, uh, with good outcomes. So that should be the, the first thought is that, you know, this is something that I can deal with. But, but it really behooves us to make sure that that's the case and to find out what it is and deal with it. The, the other uh, you know, um, uh, piece of information uh, that's so important to know is that uh, even if it is bad disease, uh, the earlier that we catch it, the more likely there will be a, a, a curative uh, um, modality or treatment that can be applied uh, before, for example, with cancer, before it's spread to the local lymph node or, or beyond, or before it's gotten so large that a simple surgery or simple radiation therapy uh, will be able to deal with it. So you want to know whether you can ignore it. That's what I always tell my my clients and my students that uh, don't ignore anything until you you feel comfortable that you can ignore it. And even then, we don't ignore it. So again, that classic uh, lump or bump. Uh, it, what we always do is measure it, uh, mm -hmm. and in today's world, of course, take a picture of it. And usually, mm -hmm. we'll have a picture with a ruler or a set of calipers with it so that we know the size of it. Uh, and then uh, do some type of screening test with it, uh, and then put that right in the, the problem list in the medical record, whether it be electronic or written, with the date, the photo if it's there, and the size. Because you may not be the same veterinarian, you may be in a busy practice that has plenty of associates, and you want to know whether things are changing. So if I, for example, the, the classic screening test for a lump or a bump that is found is a, something called a fine needle aspirate. We put a tiny needle in, withdraw some cells and have a look at it. And the vast majority of things, uh, for example, in an older dog, the classic would be a lipoma, benign fatty mass. So in that scenario, I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to have it right in the face page of my medical record, something called the master problem list. And it'll say, 
On June 18th, I found a lump that was three centimeters in longest diameter, an aspirate show that it was a lipoma. So I'm not ignoring it, I am documenting it. And the next time I see that patient, if it's changed, then I'll go, maybe I should put another needle in this or maybe I should be concerned. So yeah, it's really important to not just maybe it'll go away or let's see if it grows, is to ignore it if it's appropriate to ignore it and don't ignore it if it's not. So if my if my dog gets a lump, how soon should I go to the vet to make sure that they are not they're able to look at it? Yeah, I mean, um, I, if he, generally from an oncologist standpoint, and of course in my practice, you know, I see the you know, the the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I will always say that, you know, the earliest something uh, new is investigated, the better, because the earlier we find disease, uh, the much more likely it is that it'll be something that we can apply uh, a curative intent um, therapy to. So yeah, within reason, um, uh, the earlier, the better. The earlier, the better. Okay. Um, are there any other early warning signs that there's that cancer is is in process? Uh, certainly, and so you know, as I said, the one that clearly comes into everybody's mind initially is that oh, I I feel a lump or a bump, or my my groomer has felt a lump or a bump, and they they discuss that with you. That's kind of the classic. The others, and you know, there's all kinds of lists out there. There's the eight most common, the ten most common, the twelve, whatever. Um, those other clinical signs or symptoms tend to be uh, much less specific. That is, that they're by no means um, uh, classic for cancer. They're general symptoms that uh, could be uh, um, uh, due to cancer, but there are many other diseases. So they're ones to say. I have this clinical symptom, therefore it should be investigated. That's all. It's not, I have this this symptom, so it is cancer. But the others that we always talk about are, you know, abnormal odors, something new, uh, either from the, the ears or any other body cavity or the mouth in particular. All of a sudden, bad breath in an older dog should be of concern. Uh, a non-healing wound uh, or sores that come up, uh, those certainly should be investigated. Uh, loss of appetite or loss of weight. Uh, those are very nonspecific signs. There are literally dozens of diseases that will cause weight loss, and by no means is that a uh, classic for cancer, but it's a sign that should be investigated. Coughing or difficulty breathing, of course, the, the difficulty breathing, you know, depending on the severity, could be an emergency and obviously needs to be looked at. But those could potentially be an early sign of cancer. Increased drinking or increased urination, change in bowel movements, uh, certainly any blood in the bowel movement uh, could be an early warning sign. Again, not specific for cancer. Uh, evidence of pain, a uh, lameness that comes up all of a sudden in an, uh, especially in an older dog that doesn't have a history of of some traumatic event. Uh, even something as simple or as non-specific as lower energy levels, uh, that could be an early sign of cancer. But again, is by no means uh, classic for for cancer. So, uh, yeah, kind of the bottom line is. Most of our caregivers are in tune with their companions and they know when something is different or odd or not part of their normal daily routine. And if it's consistent and troubling, then it should be investigated, not just from a cancer standpoint, but from a general quality of life and medicine standpoint. Yeah, that makes sense. So we know if something's not right, we should get it checked out and, and trust our gut. It sounds right. like you're saying. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, do veterinarians trust our gut? You know, there's there's certain intuition that that uh, really comes with experience uh, as well. So an early uh, a veterinarian that's very early in their career should trust their gut less than a veterinarian like myself who's been practicing <laughs> for 32 years. But there is a flip side to that that that. Uh, you know, you you can get uh, somewhat cavalier and overconfident in your intuition, and you should always mm -hmm. back it up with science as well. <laughs> right, get yeah. it checked out. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what I heard you just say, and I just want to make sure I I got it because you're saying lumps, 
sometimes are cancer, sometimes are not. Right. But so are lots of other things Absolutely. that could come up. But just because your dog is extra tired or is not eating lately does not mean they have cancer. You don't have to jump to that. Yes, you certainly don't have to jump to that. That would be on on you know what we call our list of differential diagnoses. So there's a, a list of based on the symptom that's there, we would come up with you know a, 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 a list of potential uh, diseases that could be causing that symptom, and and uh, it depends on how specific that symptom is. Uh, if it's something like lower energy levels, there's literally a hundred things on that list. If there's something like bleeding from the nose, there might be five things on that list that we would want to rule in or rule out. So it really depends on how nonspecific that that clinical symptom is. So a lot of times people wonder, should I go to the emergency? Like if they're very upset, right? Because their dog, they know their dog isn't well and they get very upset about it. And they think, should I just go to the emergency or should I wait until tomorrow or the day after or a week later when my regular vet can see my dog? Yeah, and that that again um, uh, plays into the care uh, caregiver and their understanding of their particular companion. Uh, so if it's something obvious like breathing difficulty, uh, that's obvious. You should you should uh, uh, seek uh, medical attention immediately. Uh, so an emergency facility or an urgent care facility would be appropriate for something like that. One vomiting event in an otherwise healthy and happy dog is not something that I would generally say um, uh, go to a, an emergency room. Uh, I, I would, you know, in a situation like that, say withhold food for a few hours. Um, watch your pet the closer than you normally would. Uh, make sure that they're bright and alert and responsive at that point. If they start to have uh, more uh, vomiting over a period of a shorter period of time and become lethargic or or lower energy level, maybe they're becoming dehydrated, then uh, that would become more and more urgent. So it would be uh, depend on the type of symptom and how urgent it appears and how affected in general your companion is. So again, a one time, you know, if, if with, uh, for example, with the cats that I've owned in my life, if I went to the emergency room every time one of my cats vomited, I would spend my entire <laughs> life in the emergency room. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Very true. I think that's what that's the balancing act, right? Right. Now, if you're you know, if if you're unsure, uh it's always better to err on the side of I better call somebody and bounce it off somebody that has more experience. So, most emergency hospitals and if your if your general practitioner is closed, um uh will triage over the phone to the best of their abilities, bearing in mind that the information that you give is all the information that they'll have. They're not seeing your your companion. Uh, so you want to be thorough with your discussion and your concerns. And if you're not happy with the response, uh, state that uh, in a nice way <laughs> and say, look, um, I, I, I hear you, but I know my companion and and he or she is really acting depressed, and and I would really feel more comfortable being seen. Uh, then it's you absolutely have the right to override that and say, "Look, I'm coming in. I just don't feel comfortable." At the end of the day, as I've said uh, uh, before, and I always teach that uh, the caregiver is the is the best judge of their animal's quality of life, um, and uh, uh, listen to them because they see that that. Uh, um, companion in the natural environment. Whereas we as veterinarians, we see them in an unusual environment in hospital. They're stressed. They're like kids. You go to the pediatrician, my kids always got better as soon as they walked into the door because of stress <laughs> or whatever. They're always, their symptoms go away and you're standing there going, well, really, he was doing this before. But, <laughs> right. The adrenaline yeah. kicks in, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the adrenaline is a miracle. Uh, a miracle. It can be. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's fairly interesting. So I wanted to ask you, you know, we have we have new early detection strategies entering the market. Some are covered by health insurance, pet health insurance, others aren't. Some are covered in some circumstances. What do you think of some of these new early detection tools? Yeah, so, um, and there is um, a lot of that currently coming into the market. 
And and um, uh, there is no perfect pre-screening test at this point. Uh, even on the human side, physician-based um, uh, medicine, the the scrutiny to get a, an early recognition test um, on the human side is much stricter. Uh, requires FDA approval and very very good documentation. This is all relatively new to the regulatory organizations of the government on the veterinary side, uh, and the bar, the the science bar is is quite a bit lower, and it's a little bit like the wild, wild west right now. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of tests coming onto the market. Um, they, they have some pros and they have some definite cons, and I definitely would not make a, um, a life-changing decision based on those early tests. Uh, many of them are just being developed, and um, uh, we're just applying uh, long term, a longer term data, um, collecting data on those tests as to uh, what does it mean. I always say, if I have a test, um, I, I want to have an actionable result. That is, that mm. if I get a a positive test, is there something I can do? based on that positive test. And if there isn't, then I don't want to know about it. I don't want that test. The Kind of the classic example on the human side is uh, prostate-specific antigen. And mm -hmm. every, every male over the age of 50 is asked by their physician whether they want a PSA test. Uh, be, and most generalists, general practitioners, will tell that male human that this is a very controversial test now because a lot of people will develop a high PSA and never have a problem with their prostate. Uh, and in in lesser times, five, even 10, uh, 10 years ago, people were undergoing very aggressive therapy when they didn't need to. And so that's a screening test and it's a very uh, inadequate screening test. So a lot of people, and personally, I chose not to get the PSA test because it really doesn't have an actionable result in many cases. Now, the caveat to that is if you do have prostate cancer uh, or you have some other cancer that there is a screening test, whether you're a dog or a cat or a person, uh, and the screening test, the, really the, the place for a lot of those screening tests is if before treatment, that test is very positive and after treatment, it's very low or, or non-existent, then that test becomes much more helpful to determine whether the disease is recurring or responding to treatment or not. So if somebody is interested in trying one of these new tests and seeing what they get results, they're contributing to knowledge in general, the way I present it to my clients now is yes, we can run that test and that'll get into the database for the future, but I wouldn't make any life life altering decisions based on that test. It might tell me to do more testing. Are there any exciting new things coming up? Yeah, no, I mean there are very various types of, you know, and the the idea of having a liquid biopsy. <laughs> the key to liquid biopsies right now are the holy grail is to have a, um, a, a simple blood test that will tell you very early that you have cancer in a very early stage that can be dealt with. Right, that would be the ideal, right? That's right. what we're hoping and for. And the, the types of, of liquid biopsies that are currently available, the sensitivity for them right now is still suspect. Uh, until we know a lot more, uh, for example, some of the tests that are currently available will give you a... Uh, something as short as a five-week lead time before you would have diagnosed it anyways. Mm -hmm. Now, is five weeks an actionable period of time to know? Maybe, but not likely. So we're talking about tests that could um, uh, uh, diagnose cancer before it, when it's still a single cell or, or a few thousand or a few million cells before it, it uh, grows into an actual tumor. Uh, those are the kinds of tests that um, there are some uh, uh, tests like that that are in early development, both in the human uh, oncology world and the veterinary oncology world. We're just not quite there yet. Are there any other early detection strategies 
that we haven't talked about already that you think might be helpful for people to keep in mind? Yeah, I think I think um, uh, just getting back to our basic discussion of what are potential warning signs of cancer and acting on them early, and really nothing um, is as good as having routine veterinary care. So at least, especially in 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 um, companion animals, dogs and cats, dogs that get above the age of six uh, should have a, at least an, um, an annual and sometimes and as they get older and they're slowing down, a perhaps twice a year physical exam by a veterinarian uh, because that's where um, a lot of the early signs can be picked up. Are there any imaging tests that you think people should be doing routinely as dogs get older? In those wellness exams? Yeah, so there are certainly routine imaging or diagnostics that are used on the human side. I mean, the classic example would be colonoscopy for colon cancer, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, dogs, uh, the, the incidence of colon cancer is extremely low in dogs. So that's not something that we would routinely recommend. Uh, in people, mammographies for breast cancer very early, uh, for women at risk earlier than women that don't have risk factors, certainly the it's kind of a moving target, but anywhere from 40 to 50 years of age. Because our dog population, at least in North America, is a, primarily a neutered or a spayed population, the risk of of breast cancer is extremely low, mammary cancer in dogs. So we don't really recommend routine imaging uh, uh, in that case. Um, I have patients or I have caregivers that come to me and say, look, I want a, I want an annual CAT scan for my dog uh, every year. And, you know, and I'll look them in the eye and say, look, the, the cost benefit of doing that just isn't established in the dog. Um, yeah, we can do it. Uh, no diagnostic test or virtually no diagnostic test is without risk. Uh, CT scans do increase, uh, very small, but um, uh, over time could build up uh, radiation exposure, for example. As the newer machines come along, the the radiation exposure gets less and less over time. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very helpful. Again, my pleasure. Uh, you know, anything we can do to uh, uh, educate ourselves and and um, the you know I'm a I'm a caregiver of companion animals as well, and so uh, anything I can do to uh, enhance early detection and enhance the quality and quantity of our companions. Uh, lifespan, uh, I'm certainly on board for it. Well, thank you. And I hope you'll join us again if we have more interesting questions to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Thank you so much. Check the video description for lots of links to invaluable resources. And remember, if you see something or you feel something or your dog's just not doing right, that matters. Get it checked out sooner. Do not wait. I'm Molly Jacobson. Again, I will see you soon in the next video. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcancer.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.